Hello, my name is Daniel and welcome to my video on the constructive alignment model. So the constructive alignment is a very simple model, but it is really important. It is the best helper if you want to plan your, uh, your teaching course and it also can help you to analyze your course if something does not work out the way you plan it to. Um, yeah, so let's see what the model is telling us. I'm going to start by introducing this man to you. This is Professor John Biggs. He originates from Tasmania and he worked as a professor in pedagogical psychology in Australia, Canada, Great Britain and also Hong Kong. John Biggs invented the idea of the constructive alignment model. So his question was how can we make sure that our students are going to achieve uh, the intended learning outcomes of the course. Also the constructive alignment can give you an idea how to make sure that you you know you don't have the feeling that you're always kind of fighting against the students. You have to push them or to force them doing things they don't really want to do and they try to trick you or sneak around uh, the corners you know. Um, so but that you have the feeling that you're working together with the students and uh, achieving your learning outcomes. So this model originates from university teaching and learning, but you can use it for any kinds of formal teaching and learning situation as well. Now let's have a look at this model. So John Big says there are three elements of your course that have to be aligned in a constructive way. So what is the first thing you should think about when planning your course? Of course, it's a definition of learning outcomes. So the question is, what should the students be able to do after they have finished the course? Two things are important. Of course, this is about the content of your course. So the theories, the models, the equations, and all the fancy scientific stuff you want to teach about. But this is not enough. For having a good learning outcome, you also have to think about the level of competence. So the question is, what should the students be able to do with this knowledge at all? So is it just that they know this stuff or they can repeat it or should they be able to apply to any kind of situation? I want to give you an example. It may be quite a very illustrative pity example, but I hope it helps that you get the idea here. So imagine you have a course about uh, bicycles, you know, then maybe you can give just an introductory lecture and talk about the history of the bicycle and who, who invented it and um, what influence do bicycles have on traffic, on health and on the environment, for example. You can do that. This could be a very cool course, but maybe you want to go beyond that and you want to do something um, that gives your students some competencies. So you have several uh, possibilities over here. So maybe you say, okay, what uh, you should be able to see, you know, there are different types of bicycles out there. There are BMX bikes or racing bikes or street bikes, mountain bikes and all the stuff. And I want my students to be able to distinguish between types of bikes. So they should know the different kinds of bikes and know the features and how to distinguish between them. Or you could say, uh, what would be really important for me is that you are able to fix a broken bike, for example, you know. Um, or, of course, you can say what is really important to be a part of this society is um, you should be able to ride a bike. Now you see, so the topic always is something about bicycles and there are uh, yeah, some contents that should be in any course, but some contents could be special for the one or the other course. But the competence that the student should get out of the course is very different. Okay, let's move on to the second step. Now that you have cleared your learning outcomes, uh, what is the second uh, second thing you should uh, think about? And maybe it's not what you would expect at this point. Usually now you start to plan um, your material and your um, your methods, but 
uh, John Big says now it's the best point to think about your assessment. Why is this so important? It's important because um, if you are not able to assess your learning outcomes in the end of the term, then it's really hard to bring the students in line. Again, two things are important when thinking about the assessment. So one thing is, of course, the task. So there's a task that the students have to fulfill to pass the uh, assessment. Um, but this is not all. You also have to think about the type of assessment. So which type of assessment um, would, uh, would make possible, uh, which would uh, suit to the learning outcome you just defined. Now let's get back to our example. So if you want the students to distinguish between types of bikes, then the task is defined. The task is please distinguish between types of bikes. You can do that in several uh, types of assessment. For example, you can use a written exam with photos of bicycles or descriptions of bicycles. And the students should say, okay, this is a BMX and this is a racing bike. Or you can just bring some bikes into the lecture hall and point on one bike and ask the students, okay, which type of bike is this? Or you go outside the real world and if a bicycle passes by by any chance, then you point on it and ask, okay, what is this? So you see the type of assessment can be different, but the task is well defined. If your learning outcome would be, okay, uh, the student should be able to fix a bike, then of course um, your assessment is also please fix a bike this is the task and you see the type of assessment so a written exam does not really suit to this task uh, so you have to change and make something else like a, a performance task at this point and if your learning outcome is the student should be able to ride a bike then of course the best way to assess this is let them ride a bike. So the task is uh, go on the bike through a uh, parkour maybe uh, without falling down. And yeah, so you also have to find the type of assessment in this case. So sometimes it really goes hand in hand. Now if you connect the learning outcomes and the assessment in this way, then it is constructive aligned. Let's move on to the third thing you should think about. So now you define your learning outcomes and you define your assessment that will be in the end of the course. Um, now the next thing is plan your learning activities. I, as I said your learning activities but what I really mean is the learning activities that your students have to do to achieve the learning outcomes and pass the assessment in the end. Because it's not really important what you as a teacher are doing while the term is going on. It's important that the students are practicing, are learning and are doing all the things to in the end uh, pass the exam. Of course your part is important. You can give them opportunities to do certain learning activities. You can help them. You can provide feedback and something like that. But in the end, it is important that the students learn. So you can think about two possibilities. You can offer in-class activities. Sometimes uh, it must be in-class activities. Think about uh, working in the laboratory. So this is something that the students cannot do at home because they don't have all the stuff. Um, or yeah, learning to ride a bike. It's helpful to have somebody behind you that you know, who's holding you in the first place and then uh, let you go more and more. But you can also think about out-of-class activities. So <coughs> some learning activities may be better done alone at home or with other students at home like learning something by root or something. Uh, this is nothing uh, where the students should be in the, s in the lecture hall or in the seminar room. Or sometimes um, the learning activities can be achieved in several ways so maybe you can give optional um, more activities, some activities in class and some activities out of class and the students can choose uh, which are most suitable for them. Let's have a look at our examples. So uh, the students should learn to distinguish between types of bikes and this is also the assessment. Then 
the best learning activity would be try to dis uh, distinguish between kinds of uh, different types of bikes. Of course, there are some steps before you have to learn the types of bikes and all the features and you know something like that. But in the end, uh, the final learning activity is practice it. Have a look at a bike and say, okay, this is a mountain bike. Oh no, this is a BMX. What did I miss out? Ah, okay, now I know the difference. I try it again. So you have to practice this on the exact the same level as the assessment and of course the learning outcomes are. So you see this is something maybe you can do in class or also out of class. If you try to learn to fix a bike then the assessment also is fixing a broken bike. What is the best learning activity? Of course the best learning activity is try to fix a bike. So work on a bike. You have to uh, have the tools in your hand and really try it, feel it. Mm. This is something maybe you can do at home if you have uh, a workshop and all the tools. Maybe it's better to do it at the university and getting feedback and instructions from your from your teacher. And if your learning outcome is riding a bike and the assessment is riding a bike, what is the best learning activity? Of course, you have to practice to ride a bike before. You have to sit on the bike. And this is where you can see uh, what I meant by saying it's not so important what you as a teacher are doing uh, while the term is going on. You can of course show how good you are in riding a bike. Maybe this is helpful in the first space to see okay how is the teacher doing it. But the second, third, fourth time uh, when the students watch you riding a bike is not more helpful than the first time. It would be better if they would sit on the bike alone. If they sit on the bike for the first time in the assessment, it's too late. They will fall down, they will fail. But if you plan it this way, so if your learning outcome matches your assessment, they have to ride a bike, and your learning activity also uh, matches your learning outcome, then all of this is constructive aligned. So please do it this way. What happens if you don't? Let's have a look on that. So let's say, let's stick to this learning outcome. You say, okay, I want you to be able to ride a bike in the end of the course. And you offer them uh, learning activities and say, okay, we are going to practice this here every week. Uh, please come here and bring your helmet and we try riding a bike. But what the students do not know is that in the end you say maybe okay it's too hard to do a practical assessment here and we don't have as many bikes and um, not as much um, equipment for a parkour and something like that and also it would be too dangerous to do it in the assessment uh, so we do something else you have to distinguish between different kinds of bikes and we do this in a written exam in the end of the term then you see suddenly there are two things not constructive aligned. So the assessment is not aligned to the learning outcomes and it's not aligned to the learning activities. I guess you know what's going to happen here. So the students are not well prepared for the assessment in the end. So you won't see if the students have achieved the learning outcomes because the assessment is not assessing the learning outcome. And the students, even if they really tried hard to learn uh, to ride a bike, they will do a bad job in the assessment because it's not what they prepared for and they will be very frustrated and angry and also you as a teacher will be very frustrated because the student um, have such a poor performance in the assessment. Let's have a look at a quite different scenario. Let's stay with the learning outcome that the student should be able to ride a bike and you announce this to the students, but also you announce in the beginning of the semester that the assessment will be a written exam where they have to distinguish between different kinds of bikes. And you also offer them your, um, your uh, exams from the last years to practice them or something like that. And they know what's going to happen there. So again, the learning outcomes are not uh, aligned with the assessment. But what happens with the learning activities? Now I make a little quiz that you can think about this question. What do you think is more likely to happen? Of course this is not a kind of a wrong or right question. There can be uh, different things that are happening or different students behave in a different kind of way. But I'm quite sure that you 
agree with me that it's more likely that most of the students are going to choose the learning activities that help to pass the assessment. So they would like to uh, practice the old exam questions and so the learning activities are also not aligned with the learning outcomes. So it's very likely that the students in the end of the term are not able to ride a bike. And even if they are, again, you won't find out. So again, this can be very frustrating for you as a teacher because um, the students may not have fulfilled the learning outcome you wanted them to fulfill and they didn't really join your learning activities you offered to them because they say, hey, why do you want me to practice to ride a bike because this is not what happens in the assessment. The students maybe are quite satisfied because they pass the assessments, get good grades, so maybe they are fine with that, but also think of you. So you see why it's important to have the learning, uh, to have the constructive alignment in mind when you're going to plan your teaching courses. Please do it that way if possible and just stay aligned. Thank you.